1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 37 to 39. 37 to 39. It says, Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed, now attention on verse 38. And Saul clothed David with his armor. Saul clothed David with his armor. And he put a bronze helmet on his head. And he also clothed him with a coat of mail. Verse 39, David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with this, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. The subject of this message in this series, Marriage Fine Tuning, is Accelerate. Don't decelerate. Come on, tell your neighbor, accelerate. accelerate. Don't decelerate. Don't decelerate. The idea of God about marriage, which he instituted, is for the man and the woman to be helped. One will chase a thousand and two will put ten thousand to flight. And Bible says that God looked at Adam and he said it is not good for man to be alone. God looked at it and said it is not good for man to be alone. And for God to say it is not good, then God must know that there will be values that will be added to the man if the man is not alone. So Bible tells us that God set before Adam all the animals, everything that he had created, and they took their turns to go before Adam. And Bible says Adam gave name to those animals, but actually what was Adam looking for? At the end of that exercise, the Bible tells us that he gave names to those animals, but he did not find anyone comparable to him. In other words, the naming exercise that Adam did was for Adam to choose his own wife. So when he saw um, the lizard, he did not call the lizard woman or wife, said lizard because it's supposed to be lizard when he saw the lion maybe the lion was too aggressive for him he did not call the lion wife he called the lion lion when he saw the tiger called the tiger tiger the elephant 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 and at the end of the day when all the creation of god had been paraded in front of him he did not find anyone that he could choose. So Bible says that he went to sleep. He went to sleep and God took out of him a rib and God formed the woman and God paraded the woman in front of him. And this time he looked at the woman and said, whoa, woman, Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So I put it to you this morning that the exercise of getting a spouse, the responsibility of choosing a spouse, God is there to help you. God is there to give you opportunity. But the responsibility is yours. If God would choose a wife for everyone, no marriage will be in trouble. 
But because he that finds a wife has found what? A good thing and has obtained the favor of the Lord. The responsibility of finding, it's yours. God will parade people around you, but if you like, you ignore them. If you like, you embrace them. The responsibility of choosing is yours. The way to get your marriage right is going to be by you, first of all, choosing right. Don't leave the responsibility to God. Even in the case of Adam. I know that Adam did say to God after Adam fell. And he did say to God that God, the wife that you gave me. Don't forget that at that point in time, Adam had already been corrupted. He was a liar. God did not give him Eve. He saw Eve. And he chose Eve. And declared he. Bible says whatever he called those animals. They are up until today. Cattle is cattle. Because of what Adam called them. It wasn't God that called cattle cattle. It was Adam who did. So likewise. You are going to be the one who is going to say. This is my husband. You are going to say. This is, you are going to be the one who is going to say. This is my wife. Don't leave the responsibility to your parents. Don't leave the responsibility to your friends. Embrace that responsibility of choosing right. So Bible says that after that exercise, he looked at the woman and he focused on two parts of that woman. Every human being is a tripartite being. In other words, you have your body, you have your soul, and then you have your spirit. Your body is your shape. Your shape is given to you by the um, formation of your bones. That is what makes you to um, be tall. That is what makes you to be round. That is what makes you to be slim. It's the formation of your bone. Some people are K-legged people. Some people are bow-legged people. It's because of the formation of your bone. And then also you have the, your impression. You have your impression. Your impression, the impression people will have concerning you is a reflection of what is in the inside of you. People will say that you are a jolly good fellow because you are happy in the inside. You always have the right emotion. You carry the right emotion. You know, you are not just hungry. You are not just short fused. You laugh all the time. So people look at you based on what's coming out of your soul and say that this is a jolly good fellow. And then you have your spirit. That is your spirit man. And that is the most important part of your being. Your emotion will come and change from time to time. This body, this corruptible body, one day will be laid down and it is going to go back to dust. It is your spirit that is going to live forever. It is my prayer that after this life, you will spend eternity with God. It is your spirit that will live forever. To me, that is the most important part of a human being. And when the spirit is conditioned, the spirit can condition the body. That is why the Bible says that if you believe anything, then it will happen. Because it comes from the state of your spirit man. Some people are not sick. But they feel sick because the spirit says they are sick. So the moment they see their doctors, without even any medication, they are fine. Because it's their spirit that is conditioning them. So my brother, my sister, when you look at Genesis and how Adam picked his own wife, we'll probably be able to know how his marriage got him into trouble. How his marriage decelerated him rather than accelerating him. Bible says he saw the woman and he focused on two parts of that woman. The first part being the body. So he said, the bone of my bone. He was mesmerized by the shape of the woman. 
A man can be mesmerized by the shape of the lady that he wants to go out with or the lady he wants to get married to. A woman can be mesmerized by the height of the man, by, you know, the biceps and the triceps and the forceps and the sixeps of the man. You know, because sometimes you see men go into gym and I'm wondering, why are you going to, so I tried to go to there too. But I found out that it was self-punishment. So I changed my mind. I picked on golf. That one is easier. So a woman can focus on the physical. And then also a man or a woman can focus on another person based on the temporal part of him. The man is in a good mood. You get to meet the man at that point in time. You think that is all of the man. But here had them worse. He looked at the woman because of the physicality of the woman and because of the emotion of the woman. He said, this is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. Our complexion was, must have been very, very beautiful. It must have been awesome. And he forgot to check out the spirits of that woman. You must understand, my brother, my sister, but that when we talk about marriage, marriage will determine your future. You can be a man of dream, you can be a woman of dream, but when you get involved in marriage, it is your marriage that will determine where you will end. I have an illustration for you. Can I have my pastor come on stage and also those who want to get married? Okay, over here. So, um, can I have Pastor come and join um, these two together? Um, not spiritually. <laughs> that is why I'm not joining them. You know, it's not, it's not irreverent. So, the joining is just for illustration. So, now, what you need to know is that after that exercise, Bible tells us that and the two will become what? One flesh. You don't see it. But after that exercise, and my brother, my sister, I explained this in my book, Get Marriage Right. And in that book, I did explain clearly there that joining doesn't only take place in the church. When you take yourselves to um, the court out and you say you want to get married, and you take your oath right there before that registrar. My brother, my sister, you are joined. And if you refuse to come to church, and you refuse to go to um, the courthouse, and you call your parents, and you call the parents of the other party, and there is an agreement, parental consent, that both of you should be married, and they prayed for you, and they release you to go as husband and wife, you are what? You are joined. People have come to me as a pastor to say that um, I, I, want a divo I want to go and marry somebody else. The marriage we did actually was traditional marriage. I said, what did you call it? Traditional marriage. I said, the most important thing is not the traditional. The most important thing is what? That's the most important thing. So when that happens, in the spirit realm, your spirit... Is locked and is as locked as handcuffs will lock two people together. Now, let me just explain this to you very clearly. The reason why it is impossible for you to separate even when you go to get a divorce is because you have a third party to your joining. The representative of the third party is the pastor. But the third party is the Holy Spirit. So you had the agreement of three people. Um, the two of you cannot agree to divorce and expect that divorce has taken place. You may divorce physically. You may try emotionally. But... The Holy Spirit 
still has the key that is joining you together. Your spirits are locked up together. Why am I saying this? Marriage is not supposed to be a trap. Marriage is supposed to be a thing of deliverance for you. It's supposed to better your life and that is why you must take responsibility of your marital decision. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, take responsibility. Because once you are joined, you are what? You are joined. So, they don't see it. They don't see it. Now, if the, um, where am I? Okay, so now, you want to go to the east, isn't it? Okay, go ahead. Go to the east. Is it easy? Is it easy? Okay, let's assume that is forward. Let's say that man who is leading the family wants to go backwards. Okay, now you ask her to come with you, but you are going backwards. No, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. You are right, you are right, don't listen to them. Is it easy to go backwards? Very, very easy. Marriage can take you forward easily. And marriage can take you backwards easily. Where there is agreement between the two. Now, I have the second couple. He, is, he wants to go forward. But, you know, she doesn't like going forward like that. She's not ready, but he's ready. So there he goes. There he, there he goes. There he goes. Now, 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 this is, this is, this is, this is somebody's home. This is somebody's marriage. So what you find out is, he wants to go somewhere, but she says she's not ready. And that's our opinion. And she will not allow him to change him, her. Now, what happens in some cases is that he can be so stupid and so foolish. <laughs> that he begins to lift up his hand to beat her. So what happens? She's well beaten that she can't even move again. Is he going to move? He who beats his wife is beating himself. Now, he, 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 the movement I was talking about, I'm, I wasn't talking about him moving in marriage. I'm talking about his career vision. Moving with career vision. But marriage is holding that down. He wants to relate with his family and our family, but she's holding him down. So because marriage is stuck, every area of his life is worth stuck. Sometimes it's the man who doesn't want to move and she wants to go and she wants to move forward. So now she wants to go forward, but he doesn't want to move. Go on. But she's moving. But she's moving. But she's moving. So there is tug of war in the house. Every statement is an argument. You didn't hear that. Every statement is what? When you ask an obvious question in your house, it has an undertone of trouble. You won't go out now. You know that the man is not dressed up to go out. But your question is, you won't go out now. The man is not dressed up to go out. So when you ask that question, you are inviting what? Trouble. What happens when he wants to go to the east, she wants to go to the west? At that particular, oh, her pain. Did you see, did you, did you hear the pain? That is why the marriage can be painful. Easy, easy. <laughs> the, 
the marriage can be painful. Because she is going in one direction and he is going in another direction. So let's talk about directions. It can be easy for them to make progress together, but the question is, what direction are they going? As easy as it is for them to make progress together, if they have chosen the wrong direction, it will be easy for them to go down. If they are not in sync, there is going to be pain and there won't be a result desirable either way. So we have to take marriage issue correctly. Now this is what Apostle Paul has to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. My brother, my sister, the emphasis may be unbelievers in terms of faith, but you must bring it down to marriage. What you don't believe in, if the other person believes in it, then that person concerning that matter is an unbeliever. You have to make sure that the person that you want to get involved with, the person that you want to get married to, or the person that you are married to, you believe in the same thing so that you can walk the walk of your marriage in such a way that is easy and is enjoyable for you both. Very, very critical and very important. Very, very. How you choose is important. Adam, how could you just look at the physicality of the woman without you looking at the spirit of the woman. Now, the thing about the spirit of a man or the spirit of a woman is that it's not something that you get to know just like that. Bible says, test every spirit. To test, to test, to test, to test. It is not right. It is not right for you to just Test on assumption. It is not right. You must test waiting for the results. When you are dating, you should test. Now that you are married, test the spirit of your spouse. So that you can know whether you have to do anything. Where did Adam go wrong? And please forgive me, ladies. I'm not just trying to... Um, you know, relegate women. But I studied the Bible very carefully before saying this. When the Lord made him, Adam, he took him out of the ground. He molded him. So God gave him a form. He says, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. So not only that God gave a form to him, God also gave him that emotion. And the third thing that God did was that God also put his breath in him. On the account of Eve, and I don't want to assume that the, uh, the account was not, give, was not given fully. I want to assume that the, the Bible is complete. So Bible says that he took out of his ribs, took it out, and formed the woman and brought the woman to him. I did not see the influence of the Spirit of God upon the woman. Now, listen, listen. If you come back to church, the Bible says that we should lay hands on baby Christians. Now, what happens is that by the laying hand of the elders or the pastors or the apostles, they will receive the Holy Spirit. I believe that God expected that which he had put in the inside of Adam. When Adam came in contact with Eve, Adam should be generous enough to download that which the Lord poured in the inside of him and poured it into her. 
that process should have taken place in a process we call dating. But they didn't date. The guy didn't want to be concerned about the spirit. Maybe because he felt that he was too spiritual. And he was fine. He was, must have been selfish. So he was not concerned about the state of the woman. All he was concerned about when his friends visit him, they should see a fine girl. When he wants to eat, he should eat a nice meal. That was all that he was concerned about. But little did he know that when the two of you are joined together in marriage, spirit-wise, there is going to be a pollution. So she wasn't spiritual like he was. And that got them into trouble. I got them into trouble. So the first thing that you want to do is to make sure that you marry right. Now, did we all get that? So you can take the shackles off. Your choice of a spouse must be spot on. Because the person that you are married to will either accelerate you to where God wants you to go or decelerate you and take you away from the place. God had made a garden and Bible says God took Adam and put him in the garden and said to him to walk it. And then the next verse, God looked at him and said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make for him somebody that will compliment him, somebody that will be comparable to him. I'm going to make him a helper. And then Eve came into his life. The first thing that you want to do is to make sure that the person you are walking the journey of your life with is the right person for you. The right person for you. Um, Bible says that when David wanted to go and fight Goliath, and you must understand what Goliath meant to David. Goliath was marriage to David. Goliath was peace to David. It was money to David. Goliath was promotion to David. It was career to David. When you get your marriage right, everything becomes right. Everything becomes right. When your marriage is right, you don't want to make too much money. When your marriage is right, you have contentment. Because most times, the person that the man wants to impress is the woman. And when the woman is already impressed, will the man have high blood pressure? But when the woman is always nagging and nagging and nagging and nagging, what happens? The man begins to have high blood pressure, slowing everything down. So Bible says when David showed up, he saw Goliath, he says, I'm going to go after my peace. I'm going to go after my joy. I'm going to go after my career. I'm going to go after everything that God wants me to go after. And Saul says, okay, you know what? For you to walk this journey, I'll give you a companion. And Saul took his own hammer and put his hammer on David. And David said, this hammer is not like my hammer. When you have somebody walking the journey of your life with you and is not the right person, that person will be an excess weight in your life. It will be an excess weight in your life. I have a question for you if you're already married. Are you an excess weight in the life of your spouse? For God says, I'm going to make him a helper. Are you an excess weight? That armor of Saul also is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for uh, burden. When you have the wrong person, you are married to the wrong person, you have physical burden that you have taken on that is weighing your life down, decelerating you. You have emotional burden you are carrying because you are not happy that you are with that person. That person is not happy that she is with you. You have spiritual burden. 
You don't believe in the same thing. You want to go to church. He doesn't want to go to church. You, you want to pay tithes. She, he, she doesn't want to pay tithes. He wants to pray. She doesn't want to pray. She wants to go to Babalao somewhere. So he said, both of you praying together. Helping yourselves in prayer. Now you have to pray times four. No, the first two to nullify the effect of the Babalao and then the normal one to do the normal prayer. Burden. So this coat of Saul on David, David screamed. He says, this is not my own. Is the person that you are with, are you able to say that this is the bone of my bone? The flesh of my flesh and the spirit of my spirit.